in this video, we're going to play around with a really cool piece of mathematics called power sets. My thanks to Brilliant for once again sponsoring today's video. More about them at the end of the video. Let's lay some groundwork first. I want to begin with an example of a set. This is the set that contains the elements 1, 2, 3. And the big idea of a set is just a collection of objects. It's kind of like a box with different things inside of it, like an apple, an orange, and a banana, or in this case, 1, 2, and 3. And then any set is going to have various subsets. So what's a subset? Well, something like the set 1, 3, it itself is a set. And we think of it as a subset of the original A because everything inside of 1, 3 is an A. 1 is an A and 3 is an A. In contrast, the set 1, 4 is a set, but it's not a subset of A because 4 is not in A. So 1, 4 is not a subset of A. Okay, so then what is the power set? Well, if you give me a set A, then the power set of A is the set of all subsets of A. It's basically a way to think about all of the possible subsets at one time. Let's do this example for the set consisting of an apple and an orange. I'm trying to think, what are all the subsets of this? Well, there's a few things. I can imagine the set that just has an apple. That's a subset of the original. I can imagine the set that just has an orange. That's a subset of the original. And then there's two kind of silly ones. The original set itself, that is the one containing an apple and an orange, is still a subset. Subset means everything in the one is in the other. And so an apple and an orange is a third subset of this particular set. And then the final one here is I have this box. I could just have an empty box, a, an empty set that has nothing inside of it. This is indeed considered a subset in a bit of a vacuous way because there is nothing inside of the empty set that is not in the original set. And so it satisfies that condition that anything in the subset has to be in the big set. So that means that my power set consists of four different subsets. The, the set with just an apple, the set with just an orange, the original set with both of them, and the empty set with nothing. Let's do the same idea, but not with apples and oranges. Let's use the numbers one, two, and three now. Well, then the power set of this set is, well, that messy thing. Note that this is one big set on the outside, and then the thing inside of it is other sets. It's like a big box that is smaller boxes on the inside. And the possible things inside those smaller boxes, well, I could have the three different types of singleton sets with just one element, the set containing one, the set containing two, and the set containing three. I could have the various two element subsets, the sets containing one, two, or one, three, or two, three. I could have the original one, two, three, and I could finally have the empty set, which we don't know in this kind of funny way, this is the empty set. Add all these up, and there are eight different elements in the power set of the set one, two, three. Let's play even a little bit further with this funky empty set thing, because it's kind of fun to think about. So my notation again is this sort of zero with a slash down it, but I just think of this as an empty box. And since squiggly brackets denote sets, I could use the notation two squiggly brackets just the same. Okay, so what is the power set then of the empty set? Now, it's kind of funny, you might think it's just the empty set, but not quite. Well, the power set is the set of all different subsets. So on the outside, you have to have the set notation. On the inside, well, the only subset of the empty set is itself, the empty set. So this is the set containing the empty set. In other words, it's a box containing an empty box. Kind of silly, but let's go one step further. Let's do the power set of the power set of the empty set. A rather silly thing to consider. Well, again, it's a set with various subsets inside of it. One of them is always going to be the empty set, and the other one's going to be the original, which was the set containing the empty set. There was only one thing in the original power set of the empty set, and so that's either not included or included. This has two elements in it. So we've seen a subset with two elements. So we've seen an So thus far, we've seen a power set with two elements, with four elements, with eight elements. And it sort of makes me think that there's going to be a bit of a pattern here. So how do we deal with the number of elements in a power set? So let's consider, say, just one, two, three. My notation for the number of elements in the set is I just use these vertical bars. There's, there's three elements in A, and so the size of A is three. But now let's try to go and think about the power set. For any given subset, each of one, two, and three is either included yes or it's not no. And so then if I try to figure out what the power set of A is, like we, I'll copy and paste what we saw before, it has this eight elements in it. And B, 
because I'm thinking of this as three objects, each which has two different possibilities, the number of elements here is 2 to the power of 3, in other words, 8, which indeed is what we have seen previously. More generally, if the size of your set A is n, then the power set of A, its size, is 2 to the power of n, because for each of the n elements in A, there's two different possibilities as to whether or not they're going to be in a particular subset of the power set of A. Now, this all works when n is a finite number. But I want to play around and show you something really cool about what happens if n is infinite. By the way, I'm putting this video in my discrete math playlist. The link to that is down in the description. And this is the typical stopping point for students taking discrete math courses. But the next thing I want to show you is just so cool, so I'm putting it in this video regardless. Imagine your set A was all of the natural numbers. So 1, 2, 3, but keeping on going, 4, 5, 6, on forever. It's an infinite set. The size of A is what we call countably infinite, because I'm using the counting numbers to get to that infinity. So then, what is the power set of the natural numbers? I mean, surely its size is infinite. The original set is infinite, and even just taking the singleton subsets that have only one element in it, you quickly get there is infinitely many possible subsets. But is it the same kind of infinity? If you haven't seen this type of thing before, what do I even mean by different types of infinity? Isn't there just one? Well, no, there's many. Let me show you what I mean. Consider this. Previously, I thought for each of the different elements in the set, like 1, 2, 3, and so forth, there's two options for any given subset. It's either included or it's not included, yes or no. But now I'm going to slightly change notations. Instead of y's and n's for yeses and no's, I'm going to do ones and zeros. I'm going to make it reminiscent of binary numbers. And the reason I'm doing this is because I want to construct a particular function. This function is going to go from the power set of the natural numbers to very specific binary numbers. That is, for any given subset of the natural numbers, I want to spit out a particular binary number. Don't worry, I'm going to tell you why I'm doing this soon enough. Here's how this function works. Let me begin with an example like the subset 1, 3. 1, 3 is a subset of the natural numbers, so it's inside of the power set of the natural numbers. What I'm going to do is I'm going to send this to a binary number. Binary numbers only have zeros and ones. And I'm going to make it always start with zero dot, and I'm only going to change the parts after that. And basically the idea is, for any number in the natural numbers included in my subset, I'm going to put a 1 or a 0, depending on whether it's in or not in the subset. So in our case, with 1, 3, I'm going to put 1s in the first and third locations, and then 0 everywhere else. 0 in the second spot, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, and all the way up. So I'll just write it as 0 0.101. So via this process, I'm taking these subsets of the natural numbers and spinning out binary numbers. By the way, so what is 0 0.101 in binary? After the point, the first one refers to 1 half. The second location, the 0 refers to 0 over 2 squared, 0 over quarter. And the third is 1 now over 2 to the third, or 1 eighth. So this is just a half plus an eighth. Okay, so let's do one more example in reverse, just to make sure we understand exactly what this function is doing. I'm trying to think, now, what object, what subset of the natural numbers corresponds to 0 0.01011101? When I look at this number, I see that there is a 1 in the 2nd, 4th, 5th, and 7th locations after the point. And thus, if I took the subset that was 2, 4, 5, and 7, 2, 4, 5, 7 under this function would match to this particular binary number. Very small very small caveat here, binary numbers are not unique. It's kind of like how in decimal 0 0.99999 infinitely repeated and 1 are the same thing. Similarly, at any point in binary, if you end with a 1, you can replace that with 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, infinitely repeated, and that would have come from a different subset. But all, I'm, but all I need for my purposes right here is that there is some subset that maps to this particular number. And so what I've done now is that any decimal expansion that we can write in this way, zero point, anything you would like to write in binary, that there is some subset that maps to this. In other words, what I've said is that I have a function now from power set of the natural numbers, these subsets of the natural numbers, to the continuous interval zero, one. That is, the types of binary numbers that I was considering were just 
all things in this interval from 0 to 1. 0 to 1 is the interval that's got like a half and a third in there, and pi divided by 4, and e divided by 3, and whatever root 2. This is a continuous spectrum of numbers. The fact that I was using binary expansions, not decimal expansions, for all these numbers between 0 to 1 doesn't matter. It's just a choice of how I choose to write it. That I'm using binary because the sort of yes, no, one, zero nature of inclusion into a subset or not allows me to map to binary very naturally. Okay, so what do we have? There are at least as many subsets of the natural numbers. The, the size of the power set of n is at least as big as the number of things in the interval 0, 1. But here's the amazing thing. The interval 0, 1 clearly has infinitely many points in it. The interval 0 to 1 has certainly infinitely many points in it but it actually has what we call uncountably infinitely many points inside of it. That it is a much larger category of infinity than the natural numbers itself. Why? Well, I actually recorded an entire video on exactly this topic previously. It uses Cantor's diagonalization to demonstrate that 0 to 1 is uncountable. There's no way to have what we call a mathematic a bijective correspondence between the natural numbers and this interval 0, 1. And because I've just shown you this function that takes in the power set of the natural numbers and hits every single thing in the interval 0 to 1, this tells us that the power set of the natural numbers itself is also uncountably infinite, a type of infinity that is bigger than the countable infinity of the natural numbers itself. It's just crazy. And in fact, we can do more. The same Cantor's diagonalization argument that I talked about in the previous video can be used to talk about power sets in general, such that the power set of a set A has a bigger cardinality, cardinality is our fancy word here for size, than the original A. We already saw this was true when A was finite, like A had size n, then the power set of A was 2 to the n, a bigger number. But it's also true if A is infinite. So in our example with the natural numbers, which are countably infinite, their power set is uncountably infinite, which is a larger so-called cardinality than the natural numbers. And there is a lot of really crazy and beautiful mathematics here, like for example, the continuum hypothesis. And uh, I really encourage you to use this as a launching spot to jump forward and, and perhaps we'll do some more of this in future videos. The final thing that I'm gonna leave you with is the following philosophical thought. Try to wrestle with this in your mind. Consider the set of all sets, or perhaps the set of all mathematical objects. Well then, the power set of that set would also be a mathematical object, and thus would have to be in the original set. So there's this bizarre sort of paradox going on when you think about the power set of the set of all mathematical objects. Uh, and I think I'll leave that there for you to ruminate about. Now, it's exam season here in Canada, and I've noticed that the most common mistake that a lot of my students make when they're studying is they study far too passively. These are things like, well, to be honest, watching YouTube videos where you're sort of sitting back and watching somebody else do the hard work. Now, that can be great. I I'm a math YouTuber. I believe in the power of math videos, but you have to do more if you want to really practice it. And that's why I'm so proud that this video is sponsored by Brilliant. And that's because Brilliant's online learning platform, at a very fundamental level, is all about interactivity and getting you actively engaged in your learning of mathematics. They have a ton of courses, but today I really wanted to show you an example in their Algorithm Fundamentals course. Take a topic like Insertion Sort. Brilliant doesn't just tell you how it works, they show you how it works visually. And then you get an opportunity to reflect on the big idea and receive feedback and help if you don't quite get it. And most importantly, you get your hands dirty actually engaging with the math and rearranging the pseudocode until you've really mastered the idea of insertion sort. Look, I could have made a video on insertion sort, and perhaps I will one day, but even if I did, you couldn't have really mastered it until you yourself got your hands dirty practicing it. And that's what Brilliant just makes it so easy to do. So go to brilliant.org slash Trevor Bazzett and sign up for free or the first 200 subscribers to follow that link will get 20% off the annual premium subscription. And with that said, I hope you enjoyed the video. Do give it a like for the YouTube algorithm because YouTube likes algorithm just as much as you and I and Brilliant do. And with that, we'll do some more math in the next video.